Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you. As mentioned, I'm actually the design lead of Goomba. Uh, we have two leads, we have a technical lead, and a design lead for this project. I think I'm going to give a bit of feedback on this, but it should be okay. So the Gutenberg journey starts with the editor. And as been mentioned, this is the current focus of WordPress and the code name for the project looking at the new publishing and also the content editing experience. And today I'm going to explore why that journey is needed and show where the path has gone so far within that journey. And along the way, I'm also going to show you uh, kind of the foundations that are for this project. And I'll end up looking into the future because this journey doesn't end with 5.0. So all journeys start with a reason. Be it a quest for a dragon, a mission to a far distant planet, they all start with a why. And the why of this journey is actually more a series of whys. It begins with WordPress. So imagine WordPress is actually a place. It's safe. It's probably a kind of isolated place as well. A little like this, a nice, safe, safe cozy castle. Why should anything change? Because we're safe, things are nice here, everything is great. There is this solid building, and there's no need to upset that or change anything to it, because change is hard for humans. And it's scary that we don't like change. But is that really the situation? Is the castle actually built on sand? This is kind of what most of us assume it's like learning WordPress. After all, it's easy to add a plugin, right? You think that. It's, we just turn it on and that's how you add a plugin. And it's incredibly simple to tag something, categorize, and publish a post. We do that daily. And who on earth wouldn't understand this? It's just something that you know. If you use WordPress, you know these things. And we maybe recognize that a few themes and plugins have little learning bumps, but they're little curves, they're gentle little under hour learnings. You can watch a video, watch a WordPress TV, anything, and, and it's going to be fixed, or just common sense, because that's what we know with WordPress. This is actually the reality for most when learning WordPress. It starts out with a good intention, but rapidly goes up and up and up, and then confusion, and then you have bits where you're just completely lost. And truly knowing WordPress is a really, really long journey to get to that point. And most in this room, you've probably used WordPress for quite a while. That's the norm. And whilst we all have different paths, we are mostly really far removed from that starting point. And as a result, it's natural that we don't remember that as much. A WordPress to most new people is a trial they have to get over while we're all here sitting comfortably able to use it. We bring our headspace of bias to this because to us, WordPress is easy. But that wasn't always the case. And even when WordPress has been learned, we have to recognize what isn't easy that we accept on a daily basis because it's WordPress. I'd like to suggest there's a fundamental flaw in WordPress. And that comes in the phrase so many of us use. And I would probably say that most of us have used this. And it's the phrase, the WordPress way. It's expected that users understand this. It's expected that those creating learn the WordPress way, work around the WordPress way. It's expected that page builders have to jump through hoops to get even the simplest of things done because of this WordPress way. And the WordPress way has made us all not see very clearly everything. It clouds. It's forced us to become limited and overgrown around us like a wood. And many of us create in this dense wood. We're working through and around the legacy trees that have fallen around us. And sure we cope, but is coping really the way to get beyond study one or whatever it is today to send the web? I would argue it's not. So the web started out with just words. And text was the currency. 
post was just words. And as time moved on, the occasional, if you're being really fancy, very poor quality image that probably took longer to download than cooking a four course meal. That's what you had on the web. But it was also a, a different web, it was a flat web, and the content was delivered simply. And people now want to publish rich content. It's something that's expected. We expect to be able to create that content wherever we are as well. We want to post photos on the moon, and write blog posts during a train ride. We expect to read and be engaged, to not just simply read a wall of text. And if we want that, we need to use an offline service to save that and to reduce that. So we have these options. The web has basically become an entertainment platform over one that just delivers straight text. This video shows Snowfall. And whilst it's a little older now, as a post, this is a story from New York Times. And this has been somewhat of a guiding light during creating Gilbert. I say story, and this really transcends the restrictions of just a post. I don't think you can just call this a post. It truly tells the story. It engages. It's impactful. Creating content rich like this should be really easy within WordPress. Straight default WordPress. And for WordPress to truly democratize publishing, it needs to reflect the needs of publishing in a changing world. So likely, your thought now is someone could use a plugin or a site builder to achieve what I am showing, to get that content rich experience. And yes, some combinations are going to get you pretty close to that. And it is fair that we expect, pretty, but is it actually fair that we expect pretty early on people to find, care, use, and care for plugins. When was the last time you actually saw a site that had less than two plugins? It's not normal, right? And to that point, when was the last time you saw a site that actually had seven plugins that were doing the same thing? That's also normal. And most sites are held together with hope, and these tiers of plugins meshed together with the same finesse, I would say, as a game of Tetris. So if any of you have actually played Tetris for a while, you know how incredibly hard to manage it is as you get into those later levels. Because as flurry after flurry of blocks happens and showers down, this is actually someone's experience, most people's experience of WordPress. They are just coping. The current situation actually blocks and holds back innovation. Anything done has to be done within the strict, relentless boundaries of WordPress. And agencies are held back, and they create amazing work, and everybody creates amazing work, but we're not creating what we possibly could unlock here. And those that create content are limited, and those creating products have to find hacks around the blockade. This wasn't the intent, but it's what happens to all software and all products after a while. At some point, you have to rethink, and an evaluation has to happen. And for a while, WordPress stood unchallenged. A little like maybe a surviving single planet in a system. But that, however, is changing because new planets have been discovered, and we aren't alone in this universe anymore. There are real challenges to the position of WordPress. And these have to be recognized and responded to. It's no longer the only or most obvious choice to have a WordPress site. Co-working spaces are no longer just filled with people using WordPress. Take a look around if you're ever in one, and you will see that many are using different platforms, such as Squarespace, potentially. Designers and developers are writing blog posts on Medium, choosing it over their own blogs. And Wix and Weebly, to name but a few, kind of a biting at the heels of WordPress and what they're offering. And whilst most are hosted, that's always the comment when these things, like, oh, it's hosted, it's not self-hosted. But they are all orbiting and pulling in users 
from what was once the WordPress and the only space that WordPress commanded. People don't want the hassle that caring for their own WordPress is. And who even has any time for that anymore? People don't have time for that. And we have to recognize that and come up with really creative and opening solutions. Without a change, the future WordPress is pretty uncertain. We have to face that fact. But, whilst right now it kind of might feel a bit bleak, this talk's taking a bit of a turn, what I really want to show is there's a project we need to do that change, and that's where Google comes in. In itself, this project isn't going to save WordPress. It's not a superheroine or a miracle cure. It is a start, though. And it's a step in the right direction to making and shifting WordPress into the future and into relevance. So all journeys are looking for. And creating a new editing experience for Gutenberg has been no different. I want to share some of the foundations of Gutenberg. And these thread through out the work that's been done. You can see them in the patterns of interactions and in the way the project is shaped. I'll also note that I'm not going to get into the technical foundations here. There's lots of really interesting talks throughout the next two days. I'm going to teach you how to build a blog and teach you different aspects. This really is going to look at a panned out version and really those kind of topics. So everything starts with blocks. These are the essence. So thinking in blocks and patterns, that is the new. If you think about if you ever learn R, you break down complex shapes into simpler shapes and then build them up. That's the way that our brains work as humans. And in digital experiences, components really are new either. Because humans are amazing pattern recognizing machines. It's in our brains, it's just part of us. And the labels may change, but the principles are really the same. You distill down to the smallest group, the smallest element and then you build up. So if everything is a block, from that point you can then combine blocks to get this incredibly rich content. And blocks have a few advantages. One of them is they isolate errors. So block by block HTML editing or errors serve as a barrier when breaking the entire post. You can just edit that block and you're not going to have that problem across the whole post. That just that block stop working. And you'll get an error message and you'll be able to deal with that there. The block is a boundary, a safe container for content. And they also, in blocks, allow for quick understanding. A foundation principle in Gutenberg is once you learn how to use the block, you understand how to use all the blocks. And blocks also allow for a lot of drop-in functionality beyond just the core ones. The potential is really only just being touched as to what this could actually mean. Placeholders are an essential part of the new editing experience. These indicate what a block is going to contain and also have a few different states. Each state guides you through the interaction. So here, on first loading, you get this call to add an image and, and really kind of engage and you know what content type this is. And placeholders can also be interacted with. The image block has an image you can resize right there and there. The gallery block, for example, has a way you can click in and add captions. And these states are something you could take advantage of potentially in a template. And also these placeholders. Imagine a template uploading showing just placeholders. Well, that's a lot better than what happens now with templating when it's just an empty, giant box that you input in. And you have no concept of what that's going to look like on the front. And it's a confusing experience, and this is part of what we can achieve with Uber, we can reduce those confusions. And placeholders really progress us to that more what you see is what you get have. Another principle that really threads through is that of direct manipulation. What is direct manipulation? Well, in simple terms, you see something, and you can interact with it, and see right there the change. So there's no way, there's no pause, you change it, you see it. And this is for an interface interaction. We actually expect now, in fact, we 
kind of demanding for the interactions. We're so used to seeing this from the apps through to the browser web. And touch devices have trained us to get this sort of direct feedback. And, and you know, we just expect to have that. Here you can see direct manipulation in Google Earth. You can make the change and then it reflects it right there in the block, even with a secondary action like this. And seeing the change is so crucial to engagement if you're creating that content, you know what you're doing. And now you can have this right there in the editor. So talking about news-based options, I'm going to talk about eating soup first of all. Because if you want to eat soup, you probably just want a spoon, right? You don't want to have a utensil with every single possibility at once. That's probably not going to work. And imagine the sheer size of that utensil. It's not really going to function right for that. And our brains are built to have everything surface because we freeze. That's just the way we work. And likewise, we're also not built to have to search endlessly for something. We grow impatient and reject an experience fast if we've had to work way too hard for it. And frustration leads to a broken experience. And that's when we have a trust problem. And nobody wants to ever use anything that destroys the trust of experience. Being able to have just what you want when you need it without hunting for options or being overwhelmed is something that Google is really trying to achieve. And there's a few ways that this happens. The biggest one is through primary and secondary actions results. Primary actions appear beside the block. They are the must-haves. Uh, the things a block simply can't function without. And these are kind of the expected options for a lot of people, what they would expect to have there. And they are right there when they're needed. But unlike the kitchen sink options, they aren't going to be so many that they overwhelm. Just enough, nothing more. And the secondary actions are in the sidebar. And these are reached by another key interaction element, which can either be the more menu or the settings box. And we bring in some outside application here for the ellipsis menu. You know, there's little icons, the dots that you see, which kind of make more content. Here you have the extras, things it's okay to discover as they aren't essential to the usage of the block. For example, styling extras, as seen here in the paragraph block. By following a needs-based approach to options, the person creating the content feels more in control. And by having the secondary actions, exploration can happen now. There's actually a kind of proven record that if people have safe exploration, that's actually a key to interaction delight. So just enough finding something and, and having that delight of discovery for those little options really makes absolute sense. So the word experience covers an awful lot of things. However, it's a foundation consideration in Gutenberg. From the actual interface to the performance, the delight, the copy, so many things make up what someone is going to experience and make up the experience of Gutenberg itself. And improving this, making a better experience than the one in WordPress now, that's all at the core of the work really that has gone into this project. WordPress right now, as I've said, has people coping just using it. And with the new editor, this can begin to change and we can start moving on the path to people thriving and really growing with the experience. Accessibility is a foundation to good experience. Not just for those you may think that need it either. An accessible experience is better for everybody. And Gutenberg has had some incredible work done along the way. And it continues to be done. The accessibility team have just been incredible with this project. They have taught and they have guided those of us that are creating it. And Gutenberg brings some new accessibility features, like this one, which I really like, that checks the color combination. These little nudges are something that we can build in and then expand across WordPress. They're a way to guide everyone to make a more accessible experience, and they're really helpful in that. They educate as part of that. As I said at the start, the experience of WordPress kind of is in black right now. 
But within Gutenberg, there is an attempt to respond to this with something called TIP. So that first experience can really be responded to. What this does is a little welcome guide that right now just takes you through the first few steps loading the editor. And this is the plan to potentially expand a little bit more, to give more of those nudges, the guides along the way to help you really level up when you're using the experience. And over time, perhaps this could also expand to get really us towards a more conversational interface within WordPress. The editor itself and WordPress itself has to work well across any device. Now we often think of just the visual and we say mobile when we're talking about this. But the truth is that all manner of different devices can be used in different situations, mobile or not. And whilst for some things an app is always going to be the right choice, having it work well, better than the current WordPress editing that does on the smaller screens, is really an essential part of the project. And it's also worth noting, as you move into thinking about mobile, this is where performance really, really matters. If a site takes too long to load, it's pretty useless on a mobile device. And that's primarily because of data plans, but also because of sheer frustration using it. That trust that I'm talking about in experience will just be lost. Nobody likes loading icons. So WordPress is built on backwards compatibility. And anything built has to really respect past content made. It also has to respect things like blocks being in plugins or things that someone really isn't using anymore. These graceful fallbacks and checks are built into Gutenberg and have been tightened and added more and more. Along with that, we really need to respect the changes you make in custom editing. HTML, and if all else fails and something does actually go wrong, offer those good default options, like maybe becoming a classic block, that's the editor that we have in WordPress now, in a block format. The new experience also adds and really builds on the existing principles within WordPress. Uh, there's a recognizing of the publishing flow, or way to tag and categorize. Patterns from the old editor exist also within Gutenberg, like the toolbar, the sidebar, and many other interactions. So it's a progression from what we have currently. Arguably, one of the survival traits of WordPress is the way that it can be extended. You plug in for that, you can do this, you can customize everything. And by code, you might do it, or, or as I say, by just dropping a plugin or a theme. WordPress can be molded to be the experience that anyone wants it to be, and that's a credit to it. And Gutenberg is going to be no different. You can, at the low level, just add blocks, and, but beyond that, there are so many different ways that you can extend. And plugins can do this, but you can also do custom code experiences, just with single cases and client experiences. Extensibility opens up a whole new world within Gutenberg of creating these I use the term more app-like experiences within WordPress, so you're actually having it right there. It's not like it's a separate thing with a plugin, it's more part of the interface. And it's going to be really exciting how this is explored. So I've so far said why the journey is needed, and I've also showed what is in the Gutenberg backpack. But let's move on and really look at the journey, the path that Gutenberg has been on. And this all starts with the phases. So there are three phases or focuses, and let's take a look at each of these. So the editor is the first one, and that's the one we're in right now, today. And whilst this is focusing on editing, the groundwork has been set for the next phases in the first. This is a reason it's going to take longer, and it has taken longer to this point, because we've been really setting that foundation for going forward. The next one is going to be customization. This is where the more page buildery aspects are going to happen. And rather than really having a hard stop in between phases, the next one is going to transition. That's why I actually like the term phases, not focuses, because it kind of gives that feeling that we're going to be having of it just kind of progressing through. And we're going to be really having that overlap towards the end of phase one, which is what we're entering. And likely this is potentially going to be by looking at templating. 
And that's one area of WordPress that is powerful but problematic to so many people when they first come across it. The last phase is that of themes. And this will involve potentially taking the work in the past two phases, maybe creating a theme that showcases that. It's kind of undetermined what this will be, but that's quite likely. It's going to be a really exciting time to see as these phases change the next one's coming and that kind of influence happens. So our stats on the GitHub repo really only show a particular view of what has happened so far. The sheer number of issues and pull requests closed is really incredible within Gutenberg. I actually love this bottom graph showing the commit activity a year ago. Just kind of, you can see these kind of flurries of work. And although one is actually just the number, and there were released versions before, Gutenberg 1.0 was reached on August the 20th, 2017. This project started a long time before that. It was worked on within a GitHub repo as it is now. The team throughout each um, kind of phase of this and the project have been meeting each week in the core editor on the WordPress Slack. And release by release, the project has grown. Features have been added, and the numbers rolled around into the high ones and then into the twos. And so many people have contributed to this project. This is going to be quite a props list when Gutenberg actually is released and WordPress 5.0 goes out. There have been more or less released every few weeks, sometimes every week, for over a year. And this has totaled uh, over 30 releases and counting. So many releases happen, I'm, you know, one happened just yesterday, so we kind of have to be careful about the numbers here. So 30 plus, I thought I was going to be safe within this slide. On July the 6th, 2018, 3.2 was reached, and the project has reached feature complete. This means all the minimum things wanted to get in for version 1 are there. This is quite a milestone. And we continue to meet in Slack each week. The conversations have grown, and those contributing have grown significantly in numbers. Today as a project, the focus is on bug fixing, iterating, and responding to feedback as the project rounds that final corner. So the project, as I said, has been worked on in GitHub, and in many ways, this has allowed some new contributors to dive in and be involved. Both designers and development and that work has been done in the open through issues and weekly meeting discussions. Teams all across the WordPress project have also joined the journey, advising and really contributing. It's not just people contributing to the code base itself though. Many people have taken this opportunity for experimentation. They have used Gutenberg and as a result also given feedback in a way that have shaped the direction of the project. And similarly, those agencies and freelancers who have become early adopters have made the product what it is today through that information back. So I'd like to share a few examples of things. Atomic Blocks is a great example, I think, of exploring what themes and blocks could mean together. This is a theme, but also a suite of blocks in a plugin. This is a really interesting approach, and it's one I'd like to kind of see others exploring. The Atomic theme is actually available now, I think, on the WordPress to all theme group hub. And I'd encourage checking it out, as even on its own, it's a really, really good example of a theme that responds to Gutenberg. As more people kind of explore what themes and plugins mean in a Gutenberg world, having tools around to jump in and use is going to be really, really important. So this kind of is a file with this and this post I'd encourage you to check out because it's a really great example of just exploring what kind of things look like. And it, this will actually allow for faster thing creation with Google Bird. And there's that kind of unlocking through blocks. Testing and feedback has been at the heart of the project, shaping and molding through the app creation. Throughout the entire life of the product so far, feedback has been listened to and responded to from many, many different resources. Daily, the reviews have been given feedback, usability tests, blog posts, issues. The feedback has been from so many different places as well. 
from universities through to a usability testing booth at WordCamp US. Every single person that has given any tiny little bit of feedback has helped make the product what it is today. Regarding the feedback, I wanted to call out just one of the many awesome blog posts and usability testing done in the community. So Jason Tennant ran some great usability tests and wrote a really detailed post going through the feedback. Through posts like this, the product has and continues to be shaped. So keep your feedback coming, and at the end, I'm going to give a link so you can kind of get some more resources and find out how you can give that feedback. It's been quite a journey so far, but we're not done. There is some path left in phase one, and the next two phases then after that. But what lies ahead? Where do we go next? This is what the roadmap roughly looks like. The next stage is opening up the experience to many more people, and this will be done likely in 4.98 with the tri-group that call out. This encourages people to discover it if you haven't before. And it also has a little bit of information that if someone doesn't want to do that, they can install the classic editor plugin. So they have that option. So after that call out, a period of feedback and iteration is going to be entered. This is where all the wider feedback, as it kind of gets more and more people exploring it, is going to be processed and iterated. Bugs are going to be fixed. Stress cases are going to be soothed, flows are going to be smoothed, and it's going to be a hectic time. But it's needed to make sure that on entering the next stage, the best possible editor is really going to emerge. And after that frenetic time, a point is going to be reached when it's ready to get into core. And this means the start of WordPress 5.0. Just like any release, this one will have a timeline, it will have leads, and it will also be done in public with posts and processes just the same as before. There's going to be an alpha and beta releases, likely a lot of beta releases, to really ground this in and get that feedback, leading all the way up to the release time. The big milestone after all of this is 5.0. But this is just the start of the journey. As then the next phases are really going to be in full focus. And so this is all expected to happen within the next few months. Exact dates though are going to be variable, as you can likely understand, we really have to respond and listen to that feedback and let that guide us where we kind of respond. So that's a lot coming up. It's going to be a busy time for everyone involved in WordPress, but I hope and I think an exciting one too. And it's been quite a journey to get it. But what about the future? I've outlined the phases, but what exactly could lie ahead? So I'm actually going to take a little bit of a, at the end of this talk, some personal views here. And these are things that I, I think, they're not facts necessarily, but these are what I think that could be and maybe could, should be the future journey of WordPress. And I'm saying that because it wouldn't really be Gutenberg at that point. It's going to simply be WordPress. The future here is the future of WordPress. Because Gutenberg is just the project name. So I think the theme elephant in the room has to be dealt with. The phrase, if you don't know, there's an elephant in the room, is that everyone's annoying this giant elephant in the room. Because that's kind of weird to do. There is no excuse for things to have everything in them. And my own feelings are that we're likely to be being shipped more into being like style guides. And that's something that a lot of agencies and a lot of people creating know and use. And maybe they become configuration files with those, but nothing really more. Themes always were best when supported, not overwhelming content. And I see them really moving back to that supporting role a whole lot more as we progress. The customizer and editor, where they end, is going to blur. And where that kind of line ends up being is yet to be seen. And those that are going to be leading the customization phase are going to be guiding that. I mentioned before that direct manipulation is kind of important and expected. I see that just getting more and more important throughout the whole of WordPress. Things are probably going to provide boundaries, but the ultimate, how content art direction, 
is going to be in the hands of those creating it. And of course, just like anything in WordPress, user models can be used to boundary this and really prevent people just making kind of problems. However, out of the box, really anyone should be able to create beautiful posts and beautiful content. How those taste boundaries are set up is going to be quite a challenge to work out, but it's a really great one and an exciting one to design around. How we enable people to take what they have in their mind and actually create that and make that with WordPress and really create that content at the next level. WordPress has to become more welcoming. It needs a new user experience. It needs things like tips to be expanded out from the editor. That's my own personal feeling. And this type of conversational interface is something people expect. It's no longer okay for someone to read an article or watch a tutorial to have to use something. The interface should at least allow someone to take their first steps and be inviting about that. And the experience really needs that helpful personality, not to overwhelm and feel exclusionary like you have to be in the know to be able to use this. Within Google, the copy has actually been something focused on. And as a project, WordPress really has to step up its use of copy and its use of this kind of text to interact with people. And as a project, we have to not retreat back into the bubble I mentioned earlier. We can't be isolated. There are other planets that have been discovered. And we aren't going to undiscover them. We can't ignore them. The reality is those products doing the same or better are only going to get more and more and they're only going to grow in what they do. This is good because this is a challenge to be answered. And being mindful of this is really the key to progressing. This is going to get us where we should have been through Gutenberg, probably a few years ago. It's where we go from here that really decides the fate of WordPress. And WordPress as a product has to be the right tool for the right time. This means kind of a lot of different things. From being the most accessible it can be through to performing well no matter where or what or what you're doing to access it. And this is the base requirement for any experience today and it's just going to grow from now on. And likewise, continue to refine research and listening to those that are using it. Surfacing the right action at the right time can be refined. And this is not just people that are developing for it, people that are using it in all the different capacities, people that are designing for it. Anyone that does anything different or anything with WordPress needs to be listened to. A truly adaptive experience is one that works kind of how you need it at a particular time. That's what you're requiring from it. And WordPress has its roots in adaption as a platform, that molding and being able to extend it and do anything you want. And this needs to be built on because this is a great quality. So as you can see, it's been quite that journey from the first commit up until today. There's a little bit to go in this first part of the quest, but the end of this chapter is kind of close. And WordPress really needs this project. Without it, the future, as I said, probably isn't that right. So many amazing people have come together, and this is the nature of WordPress, because these people have traveled along that Google journey. I'd like to say thank you to everyone that's so far done that, and invite anyone here to really come and join that journey, and help get this chapter written. So here are my slides. And also there's this link. This is from another talk I gave, but this has a lot of different links that you can kind of follow for information. And I think I should have some time for some questions. That would be the plan. Thank you. So you can only say 
want because it's going to be different based on, on the different page builders. Uh, so work has been, done to, uh, has been done talking to different page builders. So that's going to be dependent on which one you have. There's some exciting explorations that have already happened within that. So the exact path I can't tell you because that's something that they're going to be exploring now. Any more questions? Customization focus. 
how much those go is undetermined yet. But site builders and page builders are really exploring what they can use and build on top of Gutenberg. So what they're seeing it as is, I kind of mentioned, a lot of people have to work around WordPress at the moment to achieve things, because WordPress gets in the way of it. And they were not going to have that. So they're going to be able to create, it's going to be incredible, the experiences that people are going to create from this. And I'm personally excited about that. I'm focusing on shipping the product, but I'm really excited when I'm not shipping the product and what people take and run with this, because that's the WordPress way. And particularly page builders, they're going to be able to create these incredible, very different, probably, experiences. So your favorite page builder will have this boost that they can kind of do different things with. Some of them are exploring different ways, like, do they take over the whole screen, or do they come in as a block? And lots of different explorations are happening now. Uh, so if you have a particular page builder that you kind of follow and use all the time, I would encourage you to kind of see what their plans are. Lots of them are writing different blog posts and exploring that. I really can't hear you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think you said, will WordPress continue to have a text-based editor? Uh, so do you mean, so you can still, Google is just text, but there is a way that you can, are you talking about will you be able to write code specifically in that? Okay, there's a, in Google, there's a way that you can turn to code view, and you can just do that exactly within Google there. There's also an advantage with Google You can do that per block, which is kind of handy. That's the thing. If you're like, well, I just want to write my post normally that's with text, and then I actually want to go specifically into this HTML just one block, you can do that. It's part of that. The functionality of WordPress is still there within Google Mode. It's just kind of in slightly different places potentially for some things. Install this plugin and you click to then get the plugin. 
or you can install the classic editor plugin. So you have these options because of WordPress. <laughs> We're making sure that people know their options and can make that choice. So not everybody is going to do that. That's like saying, hey, are you an early? It's kind of an early adopter thing. If you click that, you'd be like, hey, I want to try this and I want to give feedback. But to get to that point, we're getting to a place where we're pretty confident that turning on and off Gutenberg will not have that problem, we'll have those fallbacks. So that's why at this point before we get there, getting the feedback is really, really important about what happens to people's content. But you have, there's so many different fallbacks that you have like that. I, I think of it a bit like a filtration system um, that you can kind of go through to make sure that we catch all that content. Yeah? Um, I have time for more questions, I think. I'm not sure if I have time for more questions. One more question. So does anyone have one more question? I don't think we have one more question. <laughs> and we, oh, we do have. So, uh, I've heard Yeah. Thank you everybody.